Howie Roseman has worked very hard this offseason to build a roster. Now he has a new task ahead of him. And that was a direct rip from my column. <laughs> I think word for word. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's got to rebuild the front office, Dave. And it's, you know, it's kind of a more behind the scenes type of rebuilding. And, you know, the the hires aren't going to uh, get the same reaction as when you sign uh, James Bradbury or trade for A.J. Brown. But these are moves that are just important when it comes to the long term future of, of the team. He's got he's got a big challenge ahead of him. Yeah, this is the Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. We want to kind of go through the turnover in the Eagles front office and scouting departments. It's been wild. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like it, honestly, uh, at least without the changes at the top. I mean, to see right. the changes under Howie be this extensive, it's it's pretty unusual. So we'll go through that. Uh, Jalen Hurts has popped up in a few quarterback ranking lists, so – We'll take a look at where he ranks, uh, according to some experts, and try to figure out if that's right, too high, too low. And then, as promised on the last pod, we're going to get into the defensive depth chart a little later and try to figure out if I was right or wrong about uh, where I placed some of those players. But, Rube, let's start with the biggest news, and it happened since our last pod, so it's our first chance to talk about it. Andy Weidel leaving for Pittsburgh, not as their general manager, but their assistant general manager under Omar Khan. It's a big loss. It really is. And, you know, it's not the first one. Um, And, you know, I think Andy had really kind of emerged as Howie's most trusted advisor. He's a really good football guy, really good scout, sharp, um, you know, and uh, you know that the Eagles were really, really high on Andy Weidel because they trotted him out at the pressers uh, before the draft with Howie. And, um, they wouldn't do that if they didn't feel really good about him representing the organization. That's, you know, it's an unusual thing usually. And and he's done it the last couple of years, but I think in the past, man, it's just been Howie for those kind of pre-draft or, or post-draft press conferences. So that just tells you how they feel about him representing the organization. And uh, it's a huge loss. And, you know, um, he was, he's from Pittsburgh. He grew up there. Um, they just fired his brother. I don't know if that had any bearing on it. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's one in a series of losses and probably the biggest one because you knew how much Howie, uh, leaned on him and appreciated him and worked well with him. And, uh, it's going to be tough to replace him. Yeah, and I've had some questions come in to me about why Andy Weidel would leave his job here to take the assistant GM job in Pittsburgh because he did interview for the GM job there twice, and he apparently was a finalist for that job. I mean, the reason is Omar Khan is kind of on the the business side of things. That's that's his specialty is you know business and cap management and all that sort of thing. So uh, presumably Andy Weidel is going to have a ton of say in the personnel decisions where let's be honest in Philly, as much as we still kind of believe how his strengths are in the, the salary cap world and making trades, he's the top guy when it comes to personnel here. And they've, they've lost a lot of really talented front office people. Now this off season, you want me to run through the list real quick? Let's run through the list. Sure. I mean, you had Brandon Brown and Ian Cunningham both leave for assistant GM jobs, before the draft, the timing of which prompted the Eagles to uh, propose a rule that was passed. Uh, it basically creates a hiring window uh, for those level positions because they were really annoyed that they lost key people right at the most important time of the year for those uh, for those staff members. They lost Catherine Raich to, uh, to Cleveland, another assistant general manager spot, whether or not they call it that that's what it is, and she's going to be working under Andrew Barry there. Then you had Another Tom Donahoe. Former Eagles exec. Exactly, who left. You have Tom Donahoe at 75 years old stepping down. Maybe he retires. I mean, that would make some sense, but uh, they lose him. He's been a very trusted member of that front office for a decade now. And and then you top it off with – and there are some lower levels. We mentioned Casey Weidel and some other scouts. Um, but the big one is Andy Weidel, and that's – that's five <laughs> within a few months here. And when we asked Howie about this, what, a month ago, 
he said it went back to 2019 and he's right. I mean, when they lost Joe Douglas and then when they lost Andrew Barry, it they have to replenish and he knows that. And, and that's the process they're going through right now. Yeah. And, you know, Jeff Lurie had a comment about how we, a couple, I guess it was last year where he said, you know, we feel like we've got a lot of GMs in the building and people kind of cackled at it, but this goes to show you um, just how highly regarded the people working under Howie are. I, I, I will take exception. I think to one thing you said, I think Howie, this might be blasphemous around here. I think he's become a pretty good personnel evaluator. I, I do. I, I, yeah, I, it's it's tough to tell, honestly. Well, we'll how find you, how, out. Yeah, we'll find out. How do you separate it? I mean, that's the thing. It's like um, ultimately, it it comes down to Howie, good or bad. He has to take his lumps for the mistakes, and he gets praise for the the hits. But in recent drafts, I mean, Andy's had a big say. It's like I, I and without knowing the specifics. And they're never going to say that was Andy's guy. That was Howie's guy. You're just trying to read between the lines here. I don't know if Howie's become a better talent evaluator. The, the, the process has improved the last couple drafts. I think like the, the caliber players they've gotten have improved, but is that Howie getting better at the talent evaluation process? Or is that Howie listening to trusted personnel guys? I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, and and all that kind of makes it harder to to do this hiring process when you lose good people because you know they have to look at. I mean, how, when how we hire somebody, he has to look at his body of work. But how do you separate, uh, you know, a guy who is with another team? It's hard to know exactly, you know, unless you read their reports, which maybe they do that stuff. Maybe you know, here's a report I had on, um, you know, Dallas Goddard in, in 2018 before the draft. Maybe they do that, um, but. Uh, it, it's a tricky thing, but you know, whatever the process is here for hiring front office people, and I, I, I'm sure it involves um, Howie and, and Jeff Lurie, and I would think Don Smolensky's involved in that. He's he's at least in the higher up guys because you know he's involved in, in even though he's not a football guy, he's he's involved in the hiring process for every key role in the building, every important top executive. Um, so to, to bring in Joe Douglas and Andrew Barry and Catherine Raich and Ian Cunningham and Brandon Brown and Andy Watts, I have all these people who are coveted by other teams is, you know, they're doing something right, but now they got to keep doing it and figure out a way to keep people. And, it, you know, there, there, so much goes into being a, an effective front office and, you know, putting your ego aside and collaborating and working with others and maybe not getting um, credit for, like you said, I mean, that, you know, you could have a, a low-level scout who is the guy that first calls Howie and says, hey, this is Jordan Davis kid. you got to see this kid's tape, you know, two years ago. And, you know, so that stuff is – that's thankless stuff. you got to kind of sort through all that and, and, and figure it out. Uh, and and it's it's not easy to, to kind of do all that times five at this point, you know, or, or four or five, depending on how many you count. So – it's a, uh, it's a challenge, um, you know, but I think that it's, it's something they're good at and they got to, and they got to stay good at it and figure out how to, how to keep people. But the GM role is always going to be blocked here. You know I mean? Now he's not going anywhere unless he, he retires. I mean, he's, Jeff's certainly not going to get rid of him. If he was going to get rid of him, he would have done it already you know, after, after some pretty bad drafts. Uh, he's not going anywhere. So you got to hire people who are good, who want to be here, but know that they're not going to be the GM of this team. Yeah. I mean, but it has kind of become a springboard for, for folks too. They, they get hired here. They learn under And that's, I uh, give them credit for that. I mean, it, it seems like the Eagles do kind of have like a feeder program now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they've, they've lost some, some really good candidates and look, I, I think Howe would probably even admit earlier in his career he wasn't the easiest guy to work with. And I still think he probably isn't the easiest guy to work with, but I think he has tried to improve that part of it. Uh, the interpersonal relationships matter in a front office because, like you said, so much of it is thankless. Like, uh, and, and I think that's what Andy Weidel was really good at. Joe Douglas is really good at that. Uh, making sure the lower-level scouts – feel like they're being heard and feel like 
they're really a part of the process because there's nothing worse than imagine you're a scout and you're on the road like you know 50 weeks of the year and you're just it's it's a grind and then you bring back your reports and you feel like oh, how is going to do whatever the heck he wants anyway like that's got to be the worst feeling in the world if you're that scout trying to prop up the players you think are going to really help the football team so uh, I've seen it with Andy and I, I've seen it with Joe Douglas that they go out of their way because they're from that community. They're from the scouting world. They came up as scouts. So they understand that grind and they've been really good to, to give credit where credit's due. I mean, Andy, especially in the last few years saying, you know, yeah, we found this player, but our, our area scouts here, here, and here, these guys did a great job. And um, I think you need that. I, to, to make sure everyone's pulling in the same direction, I, I think that really helps. And I think how he's done that the last couple of years, I mean, he always makes sure, and it's probably written in his notes from the PR guys, make sure he always thanks the the regional scouts and the, the cross checkers and all those guys. Um, he always makes a point to do that. But yeah, I mean, like any job, if you feel like you're, if you feel like you're appreciated, you're going to, you know, you're going to, want to stay there and you're going to do, you know, want to do your best. It's, it's like that anywhere. Um, so th there's no question about it. Um, but still, if, if you have a chance to, to be promoted and again, you know, the NFL rules are, are really interesting. And a lot of it depends on the title when you can poach somebody from another team. And I think it's going to affect the way Howie hands out, titles over the next few months here yeah and i i think that's the, the next step here is not only are they hiring for all these vacancies and some of them will be internal promotions it's something the eagles have done really well with i mean they a, a lot of these guys even brandon brown ian cunningham um andy weidel himself i mean they they were promoted a few times here it wasn't like they were in one job here and then went elsewhere the eagles have brought them along but at a certain point, like the there's kind of a roadblock. Um, but there's going to be a, a restructuring of this front office. I, I we already have heard that John Ferrari is going to be a promotion, uh, and he's going to take an assistant general manager title. I think there's a chance they have at least one more assistant general manager. Now, it's it's kind of a tricky thing because they're you're trying to prevent these guys from getting poached. But we all know very well that they're not going to have final personnel say here. So I'm kind of wondering how that affects all of it. Because um, a guy like Andy Weidel, like, yeah, they could have called him an assistant general manager here. But the job responsibilities in a place like Pittsburgh, where there's not someone really overseeing the personnel, are just going to be different. Right. And there's the, the way the league is with titles, I mean – you could be director of football operations in one place and have a completely different job than somebody with the set, the same title with another team, or, you know, I mean, there's just so many different ways to call, you know, the, people just throw these titles around. Um, I mean, you'll see guys on the Eagles get a promotion from like manager of, of football operations to director of football operations. Like what's the difference? Yeah. One has, you know, you get a raise and one has more responsibilities, but who knows, what they are, what does the director of football operations do that the manager of football operations doesn't do? So um, I, I think it was, it might've been Ferrari, it might've been um, uh, John Ferrari was, was in that was one of the guys that had a promotion like that. But um, you know, you, you look at the, at the scouting structure and there's not a lot of, you know, those long-term guys who've been with the organization. I mean, Anthony Patch is still here. He's been here for 20 years. He came in soon after how he did. Um, I think in 2002, I think he's so, you know, I mean, he's been here uh, a long time and, and how he, you know, always speaks highly of him, but um, there's not a guy, not, not a lot of people in that position um, who, um, you know, I don't know how many other people they can promote. I mean, there, there are, there are mid range scouting, you know, coordinators and regional this and that. Um, I don't know what they think of them. I don't know how much faith they have in them. I think it'll be a combination of promotions and, and outside hires um yeah there will be promotions you know um that that casey weidel job is probably going to be uh a promotion there are a few others we heard about the john ferrari one the but they know they have to have an influx of talent because they just lost too much to say well we're just going to promote people 
because you can't just prone people and hire lower level people because then you're kind of uneven as an organization. You can't just have a bunch of new scouts. So, right. and, and we'll see, maybe Andy White will poach a few of them. I mean, that's another fear here is that he's going to Pittsburgh and they have, look, they have a pretty good thing going there in Pittsburgh. They had it under Kevin Colbert for a while. Uh, but I think there's a chance we talked about how good Andy was with those scouts that, he, he offers a promotion to a guy. He's probably going to take it to leave and go to Pittsburgh if he can. Yeah. Now, one guy who might be in the opposite um, opposite situation is Brandon Hunt, who's been with the Steelers for um, for a long time, a long time. I think he was with the Steelers as an intern, and then he went – what was he with the Texans? And then went back to Pittsburgh um, as a you know pretty high high up guy. And he was up for the GM job, which I guess means he was also up for – an assistant GM job. It looks like he's out of that mix. So you would think he would want to, he would probably want to leave now that he realizes he's not moving up with the Steelers after a long time. So, and that's an organization where like Omar Khan might have that job for the next 20 years. Like you just never know there. Yeah. They've had two GMs like the last 40 years. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if, if like two uh, head this coaches is, the last 40 years. Yeah, really. This is off topic, but, uh, I wonder if Tom Donahoe will end up working for Pittsburgh again. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's a matter of what he wants to do. If, you know, Just in some sort of an advisory role. He's kind of like a mentor to Andy Weidel, so I'm yeah. sure Andy would like to have him there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he might want to retire and move to, you know, Scottsdale. I, I don't know what he's, you know. he doesn't. I don't know Tom very well, but he doesn't strike me as like a big let, let's go out on the beach type of guy. Yeah, I don't think there's a beach in Scottsdale, is there? I mean, they got that man-made – creek there but um you know, i don't think they have a beach but but yeah I, I know what you mean he he doesn't but i don't really know him well enough to know what he wants to do at 75 but but you're right i mean obviously andy worked with him you um, know what's funny you said scottsdale and i had already stopped listening assuming you were going to go florida there because it's such a like a the easy cliche is retire and go to florida so my like my brain was already working on the joke it wasn't a good joke, but it was already I was already ahead to Florida. And then you said Arizona. Never heard. This is this gives you a little a little glimpse into Dave and, and how little he actually listens to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I listen, but if there's an opportunity for a joke, no matter how pointless, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on that. Yeah, I think I probably share that, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating though. It, I mean it really it will it, it's gonna reshape a lot of the organization. And it's just so strange to have it all kind of happen at once. Yeah, and you know, it creates a it creates a kind of image of people don't want to be here, and I don't think that's really the case. I think it's well, I think it's the the opportunity to you know to move up. I mean, everybody who's in this line of work wants to be a GM, and you know, if you feel like you have a better opportunity to do that somewhere else, you're going to take that promotion. So, I mean, every year guys are going from one team to another. So it's not, it's, that's not unusual. What's unusual is to have so many the same year and so many of your top guys. I, I don't In a think- way though, it like, if, if you're really going to be an optimist here, it could give them a chance to really change the structure. Because if you have one person leaving here or there, you're probably just going to plug and play and keep going. I, I think they're using this opportunity to really take a step back and say, all right, well, we've done it this way for X amount of years. Is this the most efficient way to do this? Or now do we try to restructure and, and figure out. And, and I like that's something I think the organization does quite well is so they, they will try to be innovative and, and figure out if there are other ways to maximize. And I think that's kind of what they're using this time for right now. Well, I do like the idea of having the co-directors of personnel, um, which Ian Cunningham and Brandon Brown were. Um, and I think they're going to keep that. I would think. And, and I like the idea that it kind of blends together pro scouting and college scouting. You know, one of the guys has an emphasis on pro and the other an emphasis on college. But they also, you know, will, you know, cover everything. I, I think that kind of, that's kind of a holistic way to do it and i think it makes a lot of sense and and i agree i think they'll yeah. do that again and especially because if you have a guy you're scouting in college and the, i mean they become pros so if, you right. know you don't want to have completely separate right um yeah 
Yeah, it's going to be an interesting couple of months. Now, what they'll generally do is announce all the moves at once officially, but we'll we'll hear we'll hear about signings and hirings over the next, I would think, two months. And you know, it's going to be certainly uh, an interesting. And I just can't emphasize how important these hires are because. I mean, without good people scouting, I mean, you're just not going to get good players. You know, you might you might get one here and there, you might get a few, but um, to really be able to get to know a player and understand who he is and figure out what he's going to be, both as a person and a player. I mean, so much goes into it, and uh, you got to work together. You got to be able to collaborate, and you've got to really you got to be able to communicate with the players teammates and coaches and parents and friends and and just really get a, a, a three-dimensional picture of who this guy it's not just a matter of well he ran a four two let's let's draft him so much more goes into it these days um so you got to find people who can do all those things and now you got to find a bunch of them yeah and you have to find people you can trust their evaluations i mean that's the thing it's like you're almost evaluating the evaluators right you know, I think I wrote that. I think I said how he's got to be a personnel guy for the personnel guys. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so, I think I read your column. I think. <laughs> well, I asked you to, so I hope hope you got to that. It was like with <laughs> yeah, the fourth no. graph. <laughs> I, I tuned out by then. I was thinking of a joke. <laughs> You're thinking of going to the beach in Florida yeah. or Scottsdale <laughs> or something. All right, let's move on here. Uh, as longtime listeners know, last year was a, a really uh, a kind of a, a funny back and forth with our buddy Chris Sims of NBC Sports because he does this annual countdown list of the top 40 quarterbacks in the league. And last year, you know, he goes through like do five at a time. So it was like 40 through 36. Oh, no, Jalen Hurts. You know, it, it keeps going 35 to 31. No, Jalen Hurts. We're waiting. And then we're in the teens like, well, Jalen Hurts isn't showing up here. I mean – He's just not. Yeah, there was a certain point you're like, wow, he's got him really high because he hasn't shown up in the top <laughs> 20 yet. So he's yeah. got him like 18th and you get 15 to 19 or whatever it is. And yeah. you're like, all right, he's not. It was like up. that Price is Right game where you're going up and then you fall off the cliff because it's not happening. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's it, just like it, the Price is Right. <laughs> it felt like that a little bit. And uh, yeah, he left him off his top 40 last year. Um, and then during the season, when Hurst was look playing pretty well for a little while there, he heard about it from Eagles fans. I mean, I think that was probably the most backlash he got last year. And we had him on the podcast to talk about it. Maybe we'll do that again at some point this summer. But he heard a ton of backlash from Eagles fans specifically. Like, what, what are you doing not having this guy in your top 40? And some of the names that he had on there, it's like kind of laughable. Uh, but he did admit it eventually that yeah. he, he he was wrong and he should have had him on there. And uh this year he does. This year he does have him on his top 40. He's been counting them down. And Rube, I wish we would have talked about this before he unveiled where he was because I, I wish we could have had a chance to guess this. Yeah. as I know you like guessing games, so I wish we could have guessed this. But he has him at 25. We know that now. What do you make of that spot? Oh, I think it's probably a little too low. I don't think it's outrageous. Um I mean, I think somewhere in the – I mean, look, he 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 took a team in his first year as a starter to the playoffs. And, and um, he, you know, I think Chris – I think if you just look at his passing numbers, yeah, he's probably in the right place. But you can't – you know, you can't do that. You have to factor in what he does with his legs, uh, the 10 touchdowns he ran for, the, the 800 yards, whatever it was he ran for. I mean, that's – he did that. He did those things. And you put it all together, and I think – I think probably, you know, seventeen to to twenty two somewhere in there, probably closer to seventeen, but somewhere in there is a is a fair place for him at this point in his career. Um, I think uh, twenty five is probably too low. Um, I mean, he's got him. He's got him after. You yeah. Know, well, here I have the I have twenty one through twenty five right in front of me right now. Okay. So at 21, he has Daniel Jones, yeah. 22, Zach Please. Wilson, 23, Justin Fields, 24, Trevor Lawrence. You should be ahead of all those guys. Hurts. Yeah, I mean, I have a hard time. Like, and, and in his own words, he says it's not about projection. It's about like what they are right now. What the heck is Zach Wilson right now? 
No, I, I couldn't agree more. And and uh, and and I, I we'll talk to Chris at some point, but I think so much of this is just based on his evaluation of them as prospects. Right. Because I, I mean, how and, and look, maybe they'll be great players. Like Justin Fields has a lot of talent. Zach Wilson has talent. Trevor Lawrence, we know, has talent. And I mean, he's got to be a really tough guy to place on this list because if anyone deserves a mulligan, it's it's that guy. But True. Daniel Jones at twenty one. And also, if you're going to go by potential, I mean, Jalen Hurts has a lot of potential to to play better than he did last year. Um, as a 23 year old first time starter in this, you know, first year in, in a new offense. Um, I, I mean, again, if he improves as much from, you know, from last year to this year as he did from his rookie year to last year, then he's a top, I don't know, 15 quarterback. So you can't, you can't say these other guys are going to improve and then grade hurts on he's not going to improve, but this is where he is now. Can't and hurts to his credit has shown. He's going to improve. Right. I don't know why I think that was Zach Wilson. I mean, he he's he I give him credit. He bulked up in the offseason. He looks good at practice. I've seen some videos. I don't know what he's gonna be. Justin Fields, I don't know if that's necessarily the best situation. Trevor Lawrence, at least he has Doug Peterson now. The Daniel Jones one to me. How? Got me. How? Like if you were asked the Giants right now if they'd rather have Daniel Jones or Jalen Hurts, like talk multiple lie detector test. Yeah. If, if you, if you offer the giants, Jalen Hurts straight up for Daniel Jones, they're making that trade. In a, in a second. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. so much of it is, is um, I think he just doesn't like Jalen Hurts. I don't think he likes running quarterbacks. No, I, I don't, I don't think it's about him liking him. I, I think he's overvaluing his evaluation of them. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense. I'll trust you on that. Just as two words sound similar next to each other. <laughs> it works. Yeah. He, he's, I mean, because he, and look, I, I like Chris a lot because he's, he doesn't kind of go with the pack and he, he, and he'll back it up. I mean, he'll talk about it. He'll explain sure. it. We can disagree with it. Um, I just don't know how you have him that low. And it's you're right. I don't think it's like he's egregiously low. I wouldn't have him as a top 15 guy. But when you read the names right in front of him there, you know, what the heck? Did you get the other list I sent you? Yeah, I have it in front of you. Want me to go through where he is on that? Yeah. This is the Pro Football Network list. Uh, this is top 32. Oh, I did want to mention on Sims list, he had uh, Gardner Minshew at 37. Yeah, that's too low for him, too. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have it in front of me. This is the Pro Football Network. They have Jalen Hurts at 17. Um, so I don't want to go through the whole list here, but they have him right behind Ryan Tannehill, Kirk Cousins, Matt Ryan, Derek Carr, Kyler Murray. Yeah, and they have him ahead of – you want to read some of the guys he's directly ahead of? He is just ahead of Mac Jones, Jameis Winston, Jimmy Garoppolo, Baker Mayfield, Tua – Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Davis Mills, and Zach Wilson at 26. Yeah, Daniel Jones, Jones at 27. 27. I mean, he yeah. has those guys where they should be. This is a better list. I think this is you – know, we have the whole list, so we have the benefit of – you want to just read, like, the top five? Um, top five quarterbacks? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Mahomes, Allen, Rodgers, Brady, Herbert. Yeah, I, I think I might go exactly in that order. And then Burrow, Dak, Lamar, uh, Stafford, and Deshaun Watson. And then yeah, Wilson. I mean, I could quibble with that a little bit. Yeah, I think it's it's a for me it's a much more accurate depiction of how I see these guys. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but yeah, well, we we don't have the benefit of seeing top of Sims list either. And I mean, yeah. Deshaun Watson's got to be really tough to place on this list. Yeah, I don't even know how you do that. Uh, we yeah. might have Colin Kaepernick on on the list soon. I, I would. How do you how do you evaluate a guy who hasn't played in six years? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think once we see Chris's entire list, we can maybe um, circle back. There's a, there you go. I think I get ten. I get ten points for using that. Um, you know, I think we can take a, a look at the the full list, but 
my my gut instinct is he's too low, and I like where he is on on the Pro Football Network list. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Are you okay with him ahead of Mac Jones? Had a promising rookie year. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone below him on this Pro Football Network list? Do you think? I don't know. Who should be ahead of him? Yeah. Um. You know, I mean, I'm a I'm a Jameis Winston fan. I, you know, he played well before he got hurt last year, but I don't know if I could. I, I probably would put Jameis ahead of him. Yeah, Baker maybe on. I mean, he doesn't necessarily have a team yet, but <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that tells you probably what people yeah. think of Baker. But you no, know, what's I, funny though. I, I I look at the people above Jalen Hurts, and I wouldn't have anyone lower. I wouldn't put him above any of those people ahead of him. Right. Yeah. I would and, and so the people ahead of him from like 10 to 16, so you know who I'm talking about. 10 was Deshaun Watson, 11 Russell Wilson, 12 Kyler Murray, 13 Derek Carr, 14 Matt Ryan, 15 Kirk Cousins, 16 Ryan Tannehill. The only guy I would consider in that group, the only guy I would consider would be Matt Ryan just because his age and um, he's going somewhere where quarterbacks <laughs> lately have not done so well. Um, but uh, I, I would still probably have Matt Ryan in, in that 14 to 16 range. But if you ask me a year from now, I think Jalen Hurts is going to be well ahead of Matt Ryan. But That's fair. And Matt Ryan still did play well his last year with the Falcons. So I'm just, I just don't, I think he's, he's kind of accelerating on the way down, but we'll see. You're, you're a Matt Ryan hater. As no, you no. Said, I like Chris Matt. Sims is a Jalen Hurts hater. You're a Matt Ryan hater. No, I just, you know, he's 38 and, I mean, I like Matt. He's a good dude. He's from here. Um, yeah, he's from Philly. So I like Matt. But where did, where did he go? Um, one of them academies, right? <laughs> I, one of those, uh, he, I what, should what, know that. I should know that too, but I can't remember. Yeah. But anyway, um, I just think, yeah, yeah, I think he's kind of on the way, on the on the downside of his career, <laughs> quite clearly. Uh, uh, Penn Charter, right? Penn Charter. So, but no, I, I, I mean, he's had a really good career. I think he's a Hall of Famer. I mean, he's like seventh all time in touchdowns and yards. Um, it'll be interesting because, I mean, is he a Hall of Famer? I think he probably is. He's an MVP. Yeah. Um, I mean, they they would go ten and six I mean, every year, eleven and five. What is the? Uh, he did the, blow the biggest Super Bowl lead ever. He did. He did. Um, Not on his own. He had help. But let's check the Pro Football Hall of Fame monitor. We're talking about talking about off topic, but I'm, I'm curious what the monitor says. Um, they have him at 102.6, and the average Hall of Famer is at 109. So they have him ahead of uh, Roethlisberger, Bart Starr, Bradshaw, Staubach, Fouts, Warner, um, Namath, and Stabler. Obviously, Jurgensen, Greasy, Warren Moon. They have him ahead of Troy, uh, you know, uh, Jim Kelly. Uh, they have him ahead of every current Hall of Famer other than Peyton, Favre, Unitas, Montana, Elway, Marino, Tarkenton, and Steve Young. Yeah, there's some hardware differences between yeah. Matt Ryan and those other guys. Yeah, and I mean... And you look at this era, it, I don't know where it starts to where it ends, but of the guys who have retired recently, you take Drew Brees over him. Yeah, and they have Drew Brees ahead of them. They have uh, Tom Brady. Uh, obviously, obviously, if he ever retires, will be ahead Brady of him. and Rogers ahead of him. But that's it. I mean, he's he's really high in this. Philip Rivers. They have him two spots ahead of Rivers. Yeah, it goes Ryan, Roethlisberger, and Rivers. Um, just to, if you don't know, I mean, the the, the uh, Pro Football Reference has um, a Hall of Fame monitor. It's a really interesting um, analytical way to evaluate a player's Hall of Fame chances based on the credentials of everyone else in the hall of fame and not in the hall of fame um, at the same position. So it'll, it'll take into account all your stats plus your championships, how long you played. Um, it, it's really cool. And I don't think you have to be a paid um, no, I don't paid think so. user. So you can, anybody can go just, just Google pro football reference hall of fame monitor. It's really, really a cool uh, device. Yeah. You can get lost in there for a few hours. Yeah. If you're, if you're a, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you're like Dave and me, you can get lost in there for a few hours. It is it is really cool. Want to flip sides of the ball here? Talk about some defense. Let's do that. 
So last time we talked to you guys, we went through my offensive depth chart. Today we're going to go through defense. And it, look, it was a little tricky to put together a defensive depth chart right now because the put it in a 3-4 or a 4-3. I could have done either. I put it in a 4-3, and I'll kind of just go through it here. Uh, I have the two end positions. I have Josh Sweat and Brandon Graham as the starters. The backups are Derek Barnett, Teron Jackson, and Matt Leo. Uh, at defensive tackle, the two starters I have right now, Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave. The backups, Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, Noah Ellis, Rennell Wren, Marvin Wilson, Marlon Tuipiloto. Yeah, I think uh, I mean I see Tua Peloto as a starter, but you know you have your own. No, I think yeah, I think uh, it's a position where they have great depth. Um, I I think um, I feel like almost starter reserve at D tackle is almost going to be like I think they're all going to play a lot of you know the same kind of number of snaps. Um, I think Hargrave and Fletch will start, but I don't see Fletch playing more than like fifty to fifty five percent of the snaps this year. I mean, even when he was in his prime, he wasn't playing more than seventy. Yeah, I think was he at last year 62, 64? Yeah, and he would normally like ramp up when they needed right. him and down the stretch. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm. A, I mean, a lot of it's going to have to do with how Jordan Davis acclimates and how well he plays and his fitness level and how much he can handle, how much of a workload, but. You know, they want Milton Williams to play too, and he'll play a little outside, but um, it's yeah, going to be. Yeah, and the diversity will help a few of these guys too. Like Milton Williams can play a 4 3 tackle. He can play a 4 3 end. He can play a 3 4 end. I mean, he's probably not going to play like an outside linebacker or a nose tackle, but he can play a few different spots if they switch up the front, which they're going to do. Right, right. So. Um, they're all going to play, but I, I would agree with those guys as as the starters, at least to to begin the season. Yeah, and it's interesting. So we, we've we talked uh, – Hassan Reddick's the one who gave us the news, but the – what, you know, the defensive ends and outside linebackers who, you know, Gannon calls them the overhang players, they're all in the meeting room together. So they're a little light numbers-wise at defensive end. You only have five on the roster, and one of them – is Matt Leo, who's, you know, the international exemption player who's 30 years old, who's never played before. So that's a little light. It is. Uh, it, it is. Um, but um, also, I don't know how much they're going to be. I mean, it's going to be really interesting. Well, how, what percent do you think they're going to play 3-4? I mean, I think it's going to vary based on a lot of things, but it sure yeah. seems like it's going to be a chunk of what they do. You're also going to see like five two. Yeah, you know. Yeah, which you know it's yeah, it's all. <laughs> uh, yeah, so then those are the the defensive linemen. I'll go to the the linebacker positions. Let's start with the Sam because that's kind of like a quasi uh, hybrid position right now. They have Hassan Reddick obviously as a starter, and then after him, I have Kyron Johnson before Patrick Johnson. Uh, since we did this, Joe Austin's been released. And then Ali Fayad as the, the deep depth there. Um, the tough one is which Johnson ends up being the backup Sam. <laughs> which Johnson ends up being the backup Sam. I mean, Patrick Johnson's got a little experience, but um, he, he didn't really do a whole lot last year. So I think you're probably right to go with the rookie. Yeah, and some of that's like, the unknown's better than known, in, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Kyron Johnson kind of has the more prototypical body type to do it, I think. He's kind of, I mean, he almost the exact same measurements as Hassan Reddick. He played yeah. defensive end in college, undersized defensive end, whereas Patrick Johnson was, you know. Uh, so that's, that's the way I had. He was a defensive end, too, but he's a little bigger. Um, and then at the, uh, and I, I split these up, but the will... I have Kazir White as a starter, Davion Taylor as the primary backup, Jacoby Stevens as the third stringer. At the mic position, I have Nicobe Dean before TJ Edwards and then Sean Bradley and Christian Ellis. That was the toughest decision I had was who's the starting mic linebacker. And it, it was a really tough one because we're, we're all big fans of TJ Edwards and what he meant to the team last year. I I had to put Nicobe Dean in the starting lineup. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I was thinking about that too before 
um, when, when you first said you were going to do the depth chart. And I, I think you're right. And now it might be a deal where TJ begins the season, uh, and, you know, until they can bring N'Kobe Dean along. But everything you hear about N'Kobe Dean is how smart he is. He, you know, he's learning multiple positions. I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think he's going to be the starter. Uh, and, and the other thing is if, I mean, he is undersized, you know, he is undersized to play Mike. Um, so maybe if you want to limit his snaps and I think he'll be playing all over the place. I think, well, he won't be playing Sam, but he'll be playing, you know, Will and, and he Mike. Blitz. Yeah, he can blitz. I mean, knowing Gannon, you'll, you'll probably see him everywhere at some point, but I think he'll mainly be an off ball linebacker um, most of the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think TJ Edwards will have a role. I think he'll have a, a fairly significant role, uh, but I think Nicobe Dean's the starter. And so here's my theory on this. Uh, Dave I has think... a theory. You know, we should have, Ben, we should have like a, whenever <laughs> Dave says he has a theory, we should have like some, you know, some sort of graphic or, or sound effects that go off, you know, maybe like a light bulb over his head or something. <laughs> we can do that in post-production. Um, I have an idea here. So, do I we think, even do post production? I don't even know. I anyway. think Jonathan Gannon would prefer to have one guy with the green dot getting the calls, making the calls, and it would be an awful lot to ask a rookie to do that. But by all accounts, the Gobi Dean is going to be able to handle it. So right. you, you say he's a, a Mike, but he he's also learning the will. He's learning the weak side linebacker position. So basically. You can alternate him, Mike, to Will based on what you need in that defense. So you need a run stuffer in there. You put him at the Will. You bring TJ in as the Mike, but you can still have him call the play. If you think it's a passing situation or the, the offensive personnel dictates it, well, then guess what? N'Kobe Dean's now the Mike, and you have Kaiser White out there as the Will. So you basically have, like, two different lines where the difference is either TJ Edwards or Kaiser White because – Dean has the flexibility to play either spot. It's really funny you said that because you just basically paraphrased an entire paragraph of my story for tomorrow on the versatility that you know, the story I'm writing for tomorrow is on on how, how much Jonathan Gannon values versatility. And Dave has not read that story yet because I just wrote it this afternoon. And you basically just paragraph uh, you paraphrased a full paragraph in that story. So that was pretty about cool. Dean. About Dean and how he's going to be used, because yeah. I agree with you. And um, I think he's going to be on the field. I, I think he's going to play more than any linebacker. I, he, you know, he'll probably get more snaps if he. I mean, if he stays healthy. And, and that's again, the big uh, look. That's the we, we understand that's everybody. the biggest. Yeah. Well, with but him especially. The only guys on defense who are going to play more snaps. I'm guessing than the Kobe Dean are in the secondary. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. He's going to play a lot. I, yeah, I think I agree with that. We yeah, I, also... and it's it's so ambitious to yeah. say, "Hey, rookie linebacker, undersized rookie linebacker, uh, third round pick," which you know makes they don't look at him like a third round pick. They're looking at him like their oh, expectations they, are like a first round pick. Yeah, no, and they should. I'm just saying it's you know if we want to make it sound even harder, he's a third round pick, <laughs> right? And we're talking about him playing multiple positions, playing the most snaps in a front seven that includes some pretty good players. Yeah. And potentially being the guy with the green dot, which is a huge responsibility, but sure. I think he can do it. We'll find out. I mean, we'll find out pretty quickly if he's going to be close to being able to do it. Yeah. If he shows up and he's overwhelmed in training camp, I don't see it happening, but we've seen rookies become overwhelmed at times. Sure. If that happens, then they they probably pump the brakes a little bit and they say, all right, well, TJ's a signal caller. We'll rotate Nicobe in. That's not what they probably want to do, but they'd have that ability if they if that ends up if they end up needing it. What, when have we ever talked about depth at linebacker with this team? I mean we didn't ever. talk about Davion Taylor, by the way. Yeah. Who played Who, okay when he's played? He was getting I mean he was getting better every week he played. And it was such a shame for him last year that he got hurt because he was getting like taking big jumps with every single game. And he was a guy who just needed the experience. And now he's unfortunately in a position where he's probably not going to play very much unless there's an injury. He's gone from being their third best linebacker 
to improving and being their fifth best linebacker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there'll there'll be some packages for him if they go if they go big. He'll be in there, and the you know the numbers tell you at some point someone's going to miss some time, and he'll be the next guy up. I would imagine because the other guys have some versatility. So you know, I, got I don't think he'd be the Mike, but I got two words for you: linebacker factory. I'll, I don't know if I'm going there quite yet, uh, but it's it's impressive and it's it's. This is the first time in a long time where you're looking at their linebackers thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah, and potentially very good. Yeah. All right, let's move to the secondary. Um, I'm glad I waited to do this until they signed James Bradbury because uh, it would have been a little tougher without it. Your top cornerbacks are Darius Slay, James Bradbury, Vontae Maddox, one of the best trios in the league. And then after that, you have a lot of talent here. You have Zach, and this is before the most recent signing. We'll talk about that in a second. I wrote this before that. You have Zach McPherson, Tay Gowan, Josiah Scott, Kerry Vincent, Mario Goodrich, Josh Blackwell, Mac McCain, Josh Job, Craig James. Yeah, and, you know, the thinking is like one of these guys is going gonna, is gonna to be pretty good. So I guess you have math on your side. You know, the odds are one of them can play, maybe two. Yeah. Maybe yeah, none. and that's the thing. I mean, and that's as much as I was looking forward to – the battle for uh, for CB two in camp, obviously yeah. that that's gone because they they have James Bradbury, but now they have all these talented cornerbacks fighting for two spots, probably two spots, and they're going to keep. And I would think they're going to keep a couple, maybe three, on the practice squad. Yeah. I mean they they sure seem to value. I mean all these guys can run. They're all young. Um, well, Craig James isn't that young, but they had all the young guys, I mean, they, they've, uh, I would think they want to keep their hands on, on a bunch of these guys. Yeah, you would think so. And then see, Jimmy Moreland. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Jimmy Moreland. Yeah. They added Jimmy Moreland who has played in this league. He, he's probably more of a nickel than anything else. And, and Navante has that job locked up, but it could be a battle between him and Josiah Scott for the backup nickel. And that could be an important job. Like we've talked about this before and we'll get to the safety position. Not a lot of depth there. So if the Eagles want to go with an extra defensive back this year, their best bet might be to add another corner. So it, you have Avante Maddox who has that flexibility to kind of play a safety role in certain situations. If your next best player in the secondary is the cornerback, and it's a nickel corner, and it could be Jimmy Moreland, or it could be Josiah Scott. Yeah, and Moreland's a guy who's um, he was he was drafted in nineteen by Washington, I think the seventh round. Started ten games in in two years uh, for for Washington. Um, had has one career interception, which I mentioned in my story. Who he had it against, and everyone got everyone got mad at me. Like you know, it's not my fault. It was Carson. We're saying we're saying his name now, right? Yeah, I, I I would do that with any player. If Ty Gowan had one career interception, I would say who was who, who was against. But it happened to be, um, happened to be Carson. And James Bradbury has one career interception against the Eagles, and it was against Carson. And they were both on balls to to John Hightower, oddly enough. So I mentioned that because I try to be thorough in my coverage of the Eagles. Dave had nothing to do with who they picked off. It was just that they did. Anyway, that's it. Still feels me. wrong, by the way, saying his name. I know, but you know, I think it's it, it's time. It, it was three teams ago, so I don't even know how that started. But um, I know but how it started. It's, it started because we were talking about him when he was the franchise quarterback who got traded, right? And like a week later, people were like, "Why are you still talking about him? He's not here anymore." So we said, "All right, we won't say his name anymore." Right. So it actually started because we were talking about him too much. Right. Um, but in any case, Moreland played 600 snaps on defense for Washington two years ago and almost 500 the year before. Um, had pretty good numbers playing in 2020. Opposing passer rating was uh, 74.1, um, which is a good number. Um, so, yeah, you know, he's a guy who's played in the league. He, now, he, last year he goes, to, um, he goes to Houston and only played special teams. He only played a couple snaps on defense. So, um, it would be kind of interesting. Look, I, I, who knows? Who knows what you're going to get from him? Um, but certainly a guy who, certainly for nothing, a guy you, you get off the waiver wire, it's uh, it's a good move, nothing to lose. 
Yeah, it's it's just so fun. They have a thousand cornerbacks. They have so many. I think what is there? Fourteen on the roster now. 13, 14. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, it's it's a ton. Uh, and let's look at uh, the safety position because as much as they have a ton of depth at corner, I mean, they don't have depth at safety in terms of talent or numbers. Honestly, no. they have Avant, they have Anthony Harris as a starting safety, Marcus Epps as a starting safety. Then your top backups are Kayvon Wallace, Andre Sachere, Jared Maiden, and Reed Blankenship. Well, you know, they really like Reed Blankenship. And, uh, yeah, and, I mean, they could still add somebody. I don't think they're going to add a starter-level guy. I think they're going to go with with uh, with Epsi. I think it's pretty clear how, mu- how much they, they like him. Uh, and, he's, you know, he played well last year. He really did. It's, it's going to be a matter of how, how, how he does getting his role magnified or increased. But uh, I still think they'll add somebody. I, I wonder what they think of Kayvon because – you know, he hasn't really – I mean, again, he's another one who's been hurt, and um, he, he did play some a couple years ago. Uh, he's, I mean, just there. last year they tried to give him starts, and he got hurt. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's really shown uh, a whole lot. But, again, he's a young guy, and, you know, we'll see what kind of camp he has. Uh, it's a big year for him. Uh, him and Davion were the third and fourth round picks uh, two years ago, and – that was a big year for both of them to, to to figure out who they are as players and what they can what they can give you. But they need Kayvon, uh, I would say, a lot more than Davion because they just have no depth at, at safety. Um, you're right. May, you know, Maiden's played a little bit around the league, um, but there's there's uh, it's certainly certainly a position where I I can't imagine how he's not looking to add some depth. They need it, and I, I have talked to some folks in Washington who think Moreland can play. Safety, yes. So I'm, I'm curious to see if he'll cross train. Look, look, it's a lot to come in, have to learn a defense, and then learn multiple positions. But that might help if he can offer them a little position flexibility there, and it might help make the roster too. Yeah, uh, but again, you know, if I mean, if if somebody gets hurt, like if one of the starters gets hurt, yeah, you're running Jimmy Moreland out there at safety. I'm not sure that's where you want to be, but uh, or Kayvon, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know that you're going to find somebody better at this point. Uh, would you have kept Rodney McLeod? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't really get that. Um, I understand if you don't want him to play as much, the older guy, not that old. It's not like he's 50. Um, I, I mean, for the, the salary he got, he's getting paid basically nothing. the minimum. Yeah. You know, he's not here because they didn't want him here. It wasn't a, it wasn't a yeah. contract thing. Um, you know, Maybe wanted- part of it was him too, like – Maybe they told him if you come back, your role is is not going to be the same. Yeah, I mean, but that was the case the first half. I mean, we're really most of last year. He on the second half of last year, he wasn't. He was mixing it in there with Epps and. and but uh, he was Harris. he was still a starter. You know, he was he was still play still playing the bulk of the snaps. He was still a starter. If they were kind of hell bent on this idea of Marcus Epps starting this year, and I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, honestly, I, I'd rather have Rodney out there than Anthony Harris based on what I saw last year. But I, sure. I also understand that Jonathan Guinan wants his guy, a guy who right. he feels like has a better base knowledge of the defense and is steady from that perspective. But, I mean, it's not like they couldn't afford to keep Rodney McLeod. That, and maybe they, they'll go at a veteran who's a Rodney McLeod level, like a backup, like a third. I don't know. I, I, I would have signed him. Yeah, me too. Yeah. No uh, question. Let's want to. Uh, I mean, well, I'm not going to save special teams here, and they only have three guys. But let's talk about the specialists real quick before we wrap this up. Are you surprised they didn't bring a punter in? Kind of shocked. I mean, they still could bring somebody in and see. I mean, maybe they want to see how he does in the spring. But he was awful last year. I mean, the second half of the year, he was the worst punter in the NFL, um, and he really hurt them. I mean, field position was really an issue. You look at his. I mean, in the postseason. I mean, he, he he had some shanks late in the season, you know. To 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 play to to punt for the Eagles, you got to be able to 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 punt in bad weather, in the wind and rain and cold and snow late in the season in outdoor stadiums. And he showed that he can't do it. I, I'm I'm really surprised. Yeah, me too. I 
it not even to you know maybe they'll see how, like you're right maybe they'll see how he does in combat i i think part of it is jake elliott is coming off a career year and sipos is obviously a, a really big part of that operation and i get wanting stability there but you can't sacrifice that for a guy who's not doing his primary job well Right, or maybe it's just the fact that they don't want two punters on the roster now because they, they would have to cut a cornerback, and they don't, they don't want to let the – I mean, you could bring in a punter a day before the season and just have them, you know, just go kick the ball. So Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would guess they're going to keep an eye on punters around the league. And, look, all, there, there's only – there's a group of punters and kickers. Like, these guys, you, those are the guys who are available. We all know the guys, and you kind of know what they can do. So – even though he's the only punter on this roster, I'd imagine the leash has to be pretty short. Even if he goes into the season as the guy, at the first sign of trouble, you got to make a change, right? When's the last time the Eagles changed punters in the middle of a season? I don't know. You asked me a lot of questions here that you don't know the answer to. Well, that's why I keep you around to answer them. <laughs> I don't know the last time the Eagles – Change. It's been a while, though. I mean, you know that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. What about um, Chad Henry or something like that? I don't know. Did he get benched? I don't think so. Chaz. Chad Henry, all Chaz. them guys, Sav Roca, they all punted for the entire season. I don't know. I'm going to look that up. I'm, I'm sure Sean Landetta has something to do with it somehow. <laughs> Either coming or going, yeah, exactly, or both. Yeah. yeah. All right. We got anything else before we wrap this up? No. All right. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. Did want to mention Ray Dittinger's final WIP show is uh, this weekend, Sunday. We wish him all the best, and, and uh, we appreciate his time over the years. That's all we've got. For Rube, I'm Dave. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>